My name is Anne Morgan. I'm an author mm. and a literary explorer. Mm. And it's my great pleasure this afternoon to be meeting a real life explorer. I'm an armchair adventurer, but John sitting next to me here mm. is a real life explorer. Mm. In fact, one of the most seasoned and experienced explorers we have in this country, I think. Uh, more than 60 years uh, of expeditions, mm. more than 100 expeditions to mm. all kinds of far-flung destinations. Mm the author of uh, 15 books, um, and also the president of the Scientific Exploration Society. And the most recent book is uh, From Utmost East to Utmost West, My Life of Exploration and Adventure. Um, and so we're going to talk about that today, and here's some of John's extraordinary stories. Um, but John, I was wondering if you could start off by telling us how does one become an explorer? Or rather, I suppose, more to the point, how did you become an explorer? I started because I had parents uh, who were great travelers. My father was in the church. He was brought up in New Zealand, wonderful country, uh, although he's a Jerseyman by birth, and he'd gone up there with my mother at a young age, and they started off scouting and uh, guiding in uh, New Zealand. They had to ride everywhere in those days by horse. Uh, they lived in the wild. And uh, when they came back to Britain, eventually I appeared. Um, and um, I suppose I caught a lot of it from them. But the real start that I had was going to school in Jersey, <coughs> where I learned to dive. And uh, so my first interest was following Hans Haas and Jack Cousteau underwater. And when I left that, I went over to England to Sandhurst to join the army. And I managed by some miracle to get into the Royal Engineers, who are the home of sort of army explorers. And uh, uh, they encouraged me, uh, if I behaved myself most of the time, to um, take soldiers on expeditions to do things like mapping or finding routes through mountains, swamps, jungles, and so on. And so eventually, uh, I went on from there back to Sandhurst, at the, um, where I became uh, the adventure training officer. And the commandant sent for me and he said, you are going to be the adventure training officer. Do you know what that entails? He, he was a wonderful character, General Sir John Mogg. He'd been brought up in Canada, a great outdoorsman. And um, <clears throat> I said, no, General, I'm not entirely sure. And he said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, I want you to get as many of these blighters overseas for the benefit of their character and the least possible detriment to the empire. And that's what I had to do. So I sent cadets all over the world to do worthwhile things, not military things, but worthwhile pursuits during their long vacations. And of course, one laid on to another, to another, to another, and then came the Blue Nile, um, which hit the headlines. And that's another story. Well, indeed, um. absolutely, and I, uh, we all want to hear about that. But one thing I was really impressed and, and struck by reading your book was how many different aims expeditions can have. I mean, you can have archaeological purposes, you can be doing botanical research, you can be uh. gathering scientific evidence, you can be delivering aid, delivering medical care, um, all kinds of setting up different centres and different places. It really requires a huge array of logistical skill, doesn't it? The Blue Nile is interesting because it was one of your earliest big expeditions at a time when parts of Ethiopia were still uncharted, really, weren't they? And including yes. parts of the Blue Nile. Tell us about how you came, because it was an interesting invitation that led to that expedition. Well, the, the, um, the Blue Nile um, I'd seen briefly when taking a Sandhurst expedition uh, there in 1966 and 64. And um, afterwards, we went to say thank you to the emperor of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie, who um, was a wonderful little man. And when we, when we went to see him, I always remember uh, that you had to march in one by one, bowing three times, once at the door, once halfway up the carpet, once in front of the throne, at which point he might shake hands with you. When you left his presence, you had to come out, and you were never permitted uh, to turn your back on such a great man. The problem was, as you walked backwards down the carpet, he had a collection of pet lions, so the chances of chipping over a lion were quite high. And I said to the 
minister of court, how are we going to manage this with 60 of the cadets? And he said, it's quite simple. When you bow to the emperor, you must cast yourselves down low <laughs> and you must press your forehead upon the ground. I said, hey, hey, steady, we're British. You know, normally a little bow is all that's required. Oh, no, no, he said, I'm not suggesting you be obsequious, but if you cast yourselves down low, you will see the lions that are looking behind you. And, <laughs> and so that was how we got everybody in. And we then went out into the garden. Unfortunately, our lady manager had a dress, uh, which was uh, the pattern of a leopard. And we there met a cheetah. Um, but there's a great story because then Haile Selassie said to me, uh, when you come again, as I hope you will, I'd like you to explore my Blue Nile. And that was rather like inviting an average hill walker to climb Everest. And that started a, a very large scale expedition with the backing of the army um, to go the 500 miles down through the gorges. And it led to the development of whitewater boats. We had to fight our way in and out because of a lot of bandits who thought we were income tax inspectors, <laughs> for which I had some sympathy with them. And um, it became an epic expedition which led to the foundation of the Scientific Exploration Society. Mm. <coughs> Incredibly, uh, I mean, it's a gripping read, that section. And there are some real, uh, all kinds of run-ins along the way. You talked about bandits, but also wild animals were, were quite a challenge at various points, weren't there? Hippos, uh, crocodiles, various kinds, I mean. Yeah, there were some very large crocodiles, um, but, um, uh, in the end, when we'd run out of food and everything else, I, I had the leading conservationist who was looking after crocodiles, and I said to him, look here, I, I, I do agree with your motives, but I said, we are now becoming the endangered people. We have no food left. Do you think you could shoot one crocodile? Oh, well, he said, if you insist, I suppose I could. And he was a very good shot, and he killed one crocodile, and we had with us a naval officer um, who was very good at cooking crocodiles, as they are in the Navy. And um, we went on shore, and we skinned the crocodile, and we ate the tail. But we had no way of cooking it except by frying it in engine oil on a tin lid, which we did. It tasted terrible. I don't recommend it. I wondered, I mean, you have had run-ins with all sorts of wild beasts, including, I think, a vampire bat was your most sort of, um, uh, most hairy run-in in some sense, in, in terms of the toll it took. But <coughs> I wondered which, which wild animal you would least like to be faced with. Well, a vampire bat is very small. Um, when I was um, attacked by one, I was sound asleep. And uh, I woke up in the middle of the night in an Indian hut off the coast of... Panama, I felt a prick in my toe, woke up, and the bed was covered in blood. And I thought, goodness gracious, what have I done to myself? I called the doctor. He came in, and he said, you must have stabbed your foot on something. I said, no, I haven't been out of bed. So he stopped the bleeding. He said, is there anything? Did you feel anything? And I said, I felt a prick on my toe. He said, I've never seen anyone bleed so much from a tiny prick. And then he looked around with his torch and he said, oh, there's a bat in here. And the bat was flying around and around inside them. And these things come down, they settle on the bed and the vampire walks towards you and then it uh, injects you with anticoagulant and anesthetic. So you hardly feel the bite. And then it sucks your blood. And I said, oh, well, that's all. And he said, no, no, it's not. He said, 4% of vampire bats carry rabies. So you're going to have to start injections. So I had, in the end, 32 injections in the stomach, which I don't recommend for anyone. Ooh. No, I mean, you, you, you do describe a number of medical emergencies that take place in quite remote places, malaria being one obvious one, but hernias. There was a, um, one of your team got a rather unpleasant her hernia at a very uh, inconvenient spot on one African expedition. Um, I wondered how you... Keep calm. You always have very good humor talk, talking about these things, and you always seem to keep very calm under pressure. Um, and how was it? Is it the army training that's given you that skill? How do you how do you manage to do that? Well, I was one. A general once said to me, "In everything you do, keep a steady nerve." <laughs> um, I, I I think it just 
you know, when you're looking after the welfare of a lot of other people, you've really got to think about their welfare first. And uh, in the case of the lady you mentioned who got a, a hernia, um, that was a very nasty situation because if we didn't get her off that mountain, she was going to die within 48 hours. Um, but we got her off carrying her on a, a, a local bed down a, a very precipitous path off the mountain and uh, then we got a helicopter to take her out. But it really was one of the, uh, the most difficult casualty evacuations we've ever had. And we've had a number in life. Um, one famous one, getting a man with a leg broken in four places off a mountain uh, in Mongolia, uh, was another. And he, luckily, we got him off and he went on to be uh, president of the Alpine Society. And he's now one of Britain's leading rock climbers. <laughs> but getting him off the mountain with a leg literally smashed to pieces. His name's Lindsay Griffin, some of you may know him, uh, was quite remarkable. Mm, incredible. And now, the, as I mentioned, the objectives of your expeditions can be very varied, and there can be qu some quite extraordinary objectives. You have, for example, gone in search of Atlantis, haven't you? Um, yes. How well, did that come about? I like, like, I've always been interested in any mystery, <laughs> and um, the... Um, I, I think that the, the Atlantis story was, was absolutely fascinated me. And a, a friend of mine um, had a great theory that it existed in the highlands of, of uh, uh, Bolivia. And so we took an expedition, including geologists and people, to look at the evidence. Um, and we found that the central sort of valley of Bolivia, uh, at about 13,000 feet, had in fact um, been flooded many thousands of years before, and like an inland sea had been created, which fitted in with uh, the legend of Atlantis. But we didn't find any ceramics or in, uh, firm information that it was definitely Atlantis. But if you want to go looking for Atlantis, I think Bolivia is a good place to start. Your money would be on Bolivia. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you, you've also done uh, research into um, disproving some common historical uh, assumptions that we have. For example, many of us are taught at school that Christopher Columbus discovered America, but you've done quite a bit of research to explore whether or not, in fact, there were tra was trade across the Atlantic thousands of years before <coughs> that. Um, well, I was very lucky many years ago, I got to know Thor Heyerdahl, who uh, was an incredible character, and Thor Heyerdahl as you know, had this great theory about reed boats. And uh, he'd crossed the Pacific uh, in one reed boat from South America, and he'd managed to come across the Atlantic um, from Morocco to, I think it was Barbados in another one. And um, he said to me, I believe that the ancient people of South America could have come down the rivers of South America in reed boats. So we set up a series of expeditions piloting various rivers, including the um, Rio, Paraguay, and Paraná down through Bolivia and um, Paraguay and Argentina uh, to show that boats made of reeds built on Lake Titicaca could have sailed all the way uh, to the Atlantic Ocean. We also did one from higher up onto the Amazon and right the way down to Belém on the coast of Brazil. Uh, using a, a trimaran, which we'd modeled on one that had been found in a tomb uh, in Peru, which showed that ancient people had this incredible skill to build boats out of reeds. Um, and so the theory was that if people could do all this in reeds, that maybe the first of the settlers to reach South America could have come the other way. And various eminent archaeologists, far more qualified than I am, have actually put this forward. Um, I can't say whether it's true or not, but there's a great amount of archaeological debate on this theory that the first settlers actually came from Africa to South America, not necessarily uh, from the Bering Strait. But it's, it's a very debatable subject, and I don't profess mm. to know the real answer myself. And there, there are some strains of, of um, vegetation and um, vegetables that have been found in South America that seem to have African origins. Yes, there? I mean, there yeah. are certain plants and uh, things that are found uh, in, the, um, in Africa or in Egypt, 
that must have come from, the, from South America. And uh, cocaine is one of them, obviously. So again, there's a lot of research been done into this, but of course it's yet to be proved. Yeah. Now, as, as we've already begun to understand, there's quite a lot of logistical challenge involved in many of these expeditions. Some in particular are really fiendish. I mean, the, the Darien Gap, I think, has to be one of the most logistically challenging expeditions <coughs> you've, you've led. Can you tell us about that? And, and it was an extraordinary reason for wanting to do it, this highway that was supposed to go all the way from the top of America down to the tip of South America. Um, but there was one problem, wasn't there? And you were asked to try and solve yes. it. Um, well, the Darien Gap, I knew nothing about until I was invited to lunch by um, a gentleman uh, who had a purple bowler hat um, and uh, a monocle. <laughs> and uh, I was at the Ministry of Defense at the time, and he invited me to a lunch, which was rather enticing, because lunch in the Ministry of Defense wasn't particularly good. <laughs> and uh, I went there and he said, um, a committee of uh, businessmen and politicians in Latin America, mainly in Colombia, want to complete the Pan American Highway from Alaska to Cape Horn for trade purposes. Several expeditions have tried to do it and failed. And they think, we, the British, can do it, waving his bowler hat. Um, and. Uh, I said, well, I don't know anything about South America or the jungle or the Darien Gap. He said, well, never mind. Uh, you should go and find out. So I thought we should send someone out to look for it. And I had an Irish friend um, who had um, uh, just passed a police car 70 miles an hour down Whitehall and was rather keen to get out of England for a few days. And um, I said, uh, Brendan, uh, you must go out to South America and walk through this Darien Gap and see whether it's feasible. So we sent him out with 100 pounds, off he went, and he walked right through and came back, uh, having had some pretty adventurous time, including tackling a rabid dog and so on. He staggered into my office and he said, here's the map, I think you can do it with cars, but don't ask me to come with you. I'm now off to the tropical disease hospital to be treated. <laughs> and so we formed an expedition with the backing of the government and the army and the Royal Engineers to take vehicles from Alaska to Cape Horn. Much of it is on roads, but the bit in the middle, the 250 miles of the Darien Gap, was jungle and swamp and extremely dangerous and difficult and full of bandits and drug smugglers and goodness knows what. And it took 100 days. The real problem was actually the bit in the middle. And the Range Rovers uh, broke their back axles. The teeth of the, of the transmissions exploded and came through the floor of, of the cars. We managed to buy a bent up old Land Rover to push ahead, which was marvelous. They're much better doing it than the Range Rovers. But after 100 days, we managed to get through that gap. But we only made it by eight hours because on the night, of the 100th day, uh, so the rain started. And the next day we crossed the bridge into Columbia and I thought it was rather nice because it was St. George's Day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, sadly that, that highway hasn't yet been completed, has it, 50 years later, it's still, no, they haven't bridged the Darien Gap with the highway, but you, you did yes. show that it was possible. There might be somebody here who was on the expedition. There are a few of us still alive. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, you've also, they say necessity is the mother of invention, and uh, as a result of various challenges you've encountered, you have invented or improved upon designs for various bits of kit. I wondered, which one are you most proud of? Which innovation are you most, do you think is most valuable of from all the, the innovations that you've Well, uh, from, the, from the exploration point of view, I suppose the, uh, the, the, the white water boat uh, that we developed by using Avon's um, rubber dinghies that were used by yachtsmen into whitewater boats, which of course opened up all sorts of exploration of rivers. Uh, I always say though, that we did it by accident because um, we didn't have a clue what we were doing and uh, we had many exciting adventures using rubber boats thereafter. But we were also concerned with things like paramotors and uh, 
That's one of the more recent ones that we used. Um, then things like Gore-Tex, which we tested and tried, sat-navs and so on. So the Scientific Exploration Society has got a reputation for taking bits of kit and usually breaking them, I have to say, um, and, and then testing them and see if they work. And so there are a whole range of items that we've tested over the years. Mm. Um, and obviously, 60 years is quite a long time. The world has changed a fair bit in that time. And ideas about travel have changed and ideas about the responsibilities we have as we travel have changed. I wondered how your thinking has changed, your understanding of what an expedition should do, the, the responsibilities you have <coughs> when you travel in that way. Well, without a doubt, if you go around the world, you will see how we're destroying it. Mm. And that, I think, is the real lesson. If anyone goes out today, they should do everything they possibly can uh, to conserve the world and persuade people to um, help protect the forests, the animals, the people of the world. Recently, I've become involved with the Flip Floppy expedition. Uh, some years ago in Kenya, I helped friends of mine to um, pick up plastic rubbish along the beaches around Lamu. And with this, we sent the rubbish up to Nairobi, had it cast into logs and, and beams, and brought these back to Lamu. And we got a, a local boat builder called Ali to make dows out of refurbished fiberglass or plastic. And they, although they were very heavy, he made saleable boats. And to make them interesting, he collected flip-flops from all over the beaches and being swept in from the Indian Ocean, plastered the outside with flip-flops, and he called these boats the flip-floppy boats. And with that, he sailed down the coast of Africa and gave lectures to people about stop polluting the uh, environment with plastic. And this is one of the big problems that I'm trying to work on now, is how do we stop plastic pollution, particularly in our oceans? Mm. Yeah, I mean, we were talking, weren't we, about that Texas-sized mass of plastic in, in the Pacific Ocean. That's sort yes, of I'm sure you know yeah. that in, in the center of the Pacific, there's a, a piece of sea about the size of Texas of floating plastic. I know that there's a Dutch company trying to sweep it up at the moment, good for them. But um, <clears throat> there is just so much plastic waste all over the oceans. And of course, it's got into the fish, it's got into our bodies. All of us are riddled with plastic. In long term, we don't know quite what it'll do to us. Mm. You were also telling me about dowsing, a, a technique I knew nothing. I d I n I've heard of water divining. <laughs> I didn't know that dowsing could be used for archaeological remains and other things that you... But you've been using dowsing yes. for a, a number of things over the years. I, I was taught to douse um, when, as a royal engineer because we used to look for water pipes and uh, IEDs and things like that using dowsing rods. And it was found that about one in three of the soldiers we had could actually do it and had this incredible power. Don't ask me how it works, I don't know. But I learned to do it. And one day, a friend of mine in Cyprus came to me and said, I've got an orange grove. I'm going bankrupt unless I can get water. Can you help me to find a well? I said, well, I, I've, I've done a bit of dowsing. I'll give it a go. And I went to his, um, I went to his, olive, his orange grove. I, I used an old bent uh, clothes hanger. And I wandered around. And I got twitches where the rods came in. So I put pegs in the ground. And after time, I said, you know, this place seems to be the most likely. But don't take my word, because I don't want you to invest all your last bit of money putting in a well. He said, well, I've got nothing else I can do. So he sank a well, and he got his, he got his water. He came out to my house with a bottle of champagne next night. So that's about the only thing I've really found. But we have used it on expeditions. Uh, looking for archaeological sites. On, on Google Maps as well, you were using. Oh, yes, on yeah. Google Maps. Well, one of the things I found when I was with Google, of course, you can get a map of the area you're going to. And there are people who are better dowsers than I am. There's one called John Baker down in Kent who can actually douse remotely. And he can take a, like a little thimble and he can hold it over a map and he can tell you there's an archaeological site here and he marks it on the Google photograph. I did this in Bolivia uh, two years ago. 
He marked the Google pictures. We went out to Bolivia. We had the longitude and latitude. We went to the spot. He was dead right. There were the remains of an archaeological site. So it does work, but don't t I can't tell you how. I mean, you did say that there are 30,000 unexplored archaeological sites in Bolivia. So could it, could it be that you're likely to hit one wherever you go in Bolivia almost? Um, well, I, I think that I think uh, dowsing is one way. <laughs> and of course, the other way is the new thing, LIDAR, ah. uh, which has come in. And recently, a whole new city has been found in the Brazilian jungle. So what's the, how does that work? Well, that's uh, involving beaming down radar type beams from aircraft and it penetrates through the jungle canopy, and you can see mounds of earth. A lot of the lost cities uh, that have been found, of course, were not made of stone, they were made of wood. So all you've got is the configuration of the, of the soil, such as mounds or walls. And on some expeditions, we found remains of settlements uh, in various South American countries um, where there's no wood, but there's lots of pottery, and there's lots of mounds and lots of ditches. And so the LIDAR has this advantage of being able to penetrate through the jungle canopy and find these mounds underneath. Wow. Now you've done an awful lot of work with young people over the years. You were heavily involved with Raleigh. And um, I think some of the young people that you've worked with are in the audience today, actually. Well, I think um, they may well be. But, but I look back on Raleigh and Drake uh, and it's been a wonderful thing that it's, it's created over 50,000 young men and women hell-bent on expedition. <laughs> uh, some of them, of course, have gone to great heights. And I can remember going to visit a group in Alaska some years ago who had just done an exciting canoe trip. And I said to them, now you've done that, you can reach for the stars. <laughs> and one of them did, and that was Tim Peake. Uh, wow. So m many of the young people who've been with us on expeditions have really achieved a lot. One of them is Britain's representative for the United Nations. She's now a, a dame as well. Another was the girl who started Be Bob Geldof on Band-Aid. Um, <clears throat> one of them got a, um, a, a, a Oscar, two Oscars in Hollywood for producing film. But when you look at all these young people that I'm glad are still coming together with Rally International now, it's wonderful to see that they are picking it up for the future. And I mean, the world has changed a great deal. It's sometimes easy to feel that the world has got very small and that we know everything there is to know. I wondered if you were starting out now, where would be the frontiers that you'd be looking to explore? Where are the, the places that you would be getting your teeth into as a young explorer? Well, I'd love to go to space, but I'm probably too old for that. <laughs> uh, the, um, the, uh, the jungle areas still, uh, if they can be preserved, have all sorts of hidden mysteries. Um, and then, of course, you've got underwater. The trouble is, rather like space, underwater is a very expensive business. Um, but there's an awful lot that can be done for the preservation of animals. Even the smallest animals, we forget that insects, there are, there are a great many insects about which very little is known. So one's unlikely to find some new, very large elephant, although we once did find a giant elephant. <laughs> but um, you're looking these days for the, the tiny things that have been missed out in the past, like spiders, uh, flies, and so on. And of course, the other thing one needs to look for are plants that can produce cures. And biological research into traditional medicine is something that's terribly important. And also, of course, that all these things have to be preserved and not destroyed. Mm. Um, and I wondered, I mean, you obviously have traveled a huge, a, a, a huge number of different expeditions. Is there one trusty bit of equipment that you wouldn't be without? If you had to choose one thing that you could never leave behind, what would be your most treasured? A Swiss Army knife with a corkscrew. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting, <coughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, no, I always think the most vital thing is to have a good pair of boots. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a great mass of boots. I'm going to donate them all to a museum. But, uh, I mean, I I if you're in a jungle, as long as you've got a pair of boots and a machete uh, and a Swiss Army pen knife, you can normally survive. Absolutely. Well, we're going to open up to audience questions now. Um, I wondered if anyone's got questions for John. We've got a hand up already. There's a raving mic coming. 
I was wondering, uh, are there any uh. e expeditions in the past that you perhaps might have either been wished to be a member of or perhaps even led? Sorry. So are there any expeditions in the past that you wish you'd been a member of or led? A member of? Yeah, so previous expeditions, uh, historical or in the past, that you wish you had well, led? Well, uh, yes, I think I'd love to have been with Stanley. Uh, <laughs> but uh, when he came across Africa, and uh, I mean, the trans-African expedition, unfortunately, um, he, he lost a very large number of his people who died of various causes. All the... Uh, white men with him died, uh, so probably I wouldn't have survived. But I always thought Stanley was a most remarkable character, and he and Livingston, of course, had both started as very humble youngsters uh, and, and, and not been born with silver spoons in their mouth and had fought their way up to great heights. So I, I'd love to have been with Stanley. Mm. Mm, fascinating character. Yes, a hand here. Mm. I was just wondering if you'd ever uh, suffered from something so extreme that you felt like it might be time to quit. Okay. Uh, Have you ever been tempted to quit? Have you ever had something so extreme happen that you thought it's time to stop? Oh, to stop? Yeah. Um, well, six o'clock in the morning, getting out of your hammock. Um, it's usually pretty extreme. <laughs> but um, I think that when we were doing the Darien Gap, I mean, common sense has ceased to exist. A lot of people said we should have stopped, but we were all so determined to succeed, we just kept pressing on. And uh, it was that tremendous uh, spirit by the various sappers and so on with us. One of them in particular I was talking to the other day, who was 93 and sadly going blind, uh, Colonel Ernie Dury. I can remember seeing him Nothing would stop that man. He was not going to be stopped by the weather, the terrain, the broken vehicles, whatever. And it was that sort of spirit that drove everybody on. But uh, looking back at it, I really should have used common sense and stopped. But we didn't, and we succeeded. Mm. Yeah. Very good. Um, any other questions for John? Mm. Yes, a hand here. Oh, that's, sorry. For <coughs> Hi. Uh, I was lucky enough to be on an expedition with John in 1984. Um, I'm just wondering what's next, sir, and do you need anyone to carry your bags? Oh, so this is someone who was on an expedition with you in 1984, and he's, he wants to know what's next, and do you need a bag carrier? No, no. <laughs> what, was your, what was your expedition? Ah, from Wales. Yucky <laughs> uh, um, I remember this, the Central Television uh, Company asked me to run an expedition for young people. And I'm talking about 11, 12, whatever it was, years of age. And we took this group uh, on various places. We took them to Nepal to shoot down rivers in rubber boats, to um, uh, go riding on elephants looking for tigers and so on. And we, we rather hoped that they would go on to be explorers, which I think most of them did. And I know that this gentleman is running a, a charity for disadvantaged youngsters in Wales, and good for him. Um, the next expedition I do, well, at the moment, I'm looking at various possibilities. I'm having a day of, or week of research, really. Uh, I'm very attracted by trying to set up programs to set up flip-floppy expeditions, possibly in South America where there's an awful lot of plastic lying on the beaches of uh, the Pacific beaches of Central America. So that was where I'm looking. I'd love to go west, uh, sorry, east of Suez, but at the moment that's rather a tricky area to go to, and I want to, want to keep out. So I may be looking more towards the Latin American side. Fantastic. <clears throat> um, oh, there's a gentleman here. Yeah. How do you go about funding an expedition? How do you uh. go about funding expeditions? Well, you, get, you write 10,000 letters <laughs> and you get two replies <laughs> and you obviously go to every sort of charitable source you can. We were very lucky that most of the early expeditions were supported by the army, so we got free compo rations, uh, which weren't bad, they were edible. And we also raised money ourselves and everyone paid to go on it. And nowadays, the expeditions that we do 
It's rather like being in a golf club. Everyone pays a share. Uh, and they run through the Scientific Exploration Society or through ourselves. And it's, it's just really, I suppose, begging and working and doing everything under the sun to raise money. Lecturing is one way. Writing books is another way. So buy all the books. Uh, yes. Good um, plug. John will be signing books after this session, um, just next door. So you very just a step away, you can pick up a lovely copy of his latest book. So there you go. A help give you some good ideas. Yes. <laughs> Any more questions at all? Oh, mm. there's a hand here. <laughs> Fascinating talk, thank you very much. Uh, was there any expedition where you got into a lot of trouble that you didn't think you were going to get out of in terms of bandits or other local people? Huh? So perhaps the, the trickiest expedition, the one where you really thought you might not get out of it, any particular threats or um, worries? Ethiopia, there were a few things, weren't there? Well, there very certainly good. were moments on the Blue Nile when we were attacked by... Um, local income tax rebels. <laughs> um, that was quite tricky. You were in a gunfight at one point, if I, I remember rightly. Sorry? You were in a gunfight. Yeah, well, point. being yeah. soldiers, we were armed, and we were able to fight back, but there were only 10 of us, and there were 40 of them. Fortunately, they were not very good shots. Actually, the biggest risk we had there were the, these crocodiles and the hippo. And we'd, we'd had one or two engagements with these gigantic crocodiles, some of them 18 feet long, that would come swimming at the boats. And I remember standing up with a rifle about to fire, and the uh, crocodile expert, who was a great conservationist, said, don't, don't, don't shoot, don't shoot. They're only curious. <laughs> and I thought, God, if you're wrong, I'm going, we're going to kick your backside in heaven. And he said, no, 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 they'll pass by. And they did. And these great crocodiles went underneath the boat, and you could feel their their scales scratching on the underside of the boat. And they came up alongside us, and we had a big sack full of geological specimens. And there was an Australian friend of mine with me, and he lost his patience, and he picked up a sack of specimens, and he hit the leading crocodile over the head. <laughs> Sadly, it had no effect whatsoever. The <laughs> crocodile just swam away, but the, the bag burst, and we lost all the specimens. Oh. Um, <laughs> And then down the next corner, I heard my helmsman, who was in the Navy, say, oh, my God, look at this lot. And, and there ahead uh, were these enormous hippos. And the river was alive with, with big black hippopotamus. And when we left England, I'd been to the British Museum and talked to the leading naturalist there. He said, one of the things you must watch out for are the hippos in the mating season. They get very bad tempered. And he said, you've got black boats. And I could see you being mistaken as a female hippo. <laughs> so avoid them in the mating season. I said, well, when is that? He said, you know, that's a question I hope you're going to be able to tell me when you come back. <laughs> but we, we came down the river, and we literally went between these hippos. And there they were going, onk, 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 onk. But they were far too busy with their matrimonial affairs to worry us. But at that time, I really thought we were going to be eaten alive. And later on, on another expedition, one of our boats was actually bitten clean in half by a hippo. But that was on the Congo. You, you did discover at one point, though, that high-pitched noises are quite useful. Yes, in the face of uh, but I had, a, magi I had a, a wonderful weapon that I recommend to any river explorers. Take a loud hailer with a high-pitched noise. The first time I used it was on the, on the Blue Nile. When the hippos came towards you, I switched on this beep, 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 and I discovered that mammals do not like high-pitched noise. Later on, I used the same thing to scare hippos on the Congo, and I've even used it with, with, with aggressive elephants well, in Nepal. You used a, a referee's whistle at one point, didn't you, with an elephant? A, a referee's whistle with an elephant yeah. to, sc to scare an elephant. There was a, a referee's whistle you used at one point, I think you said, in your book. With a, re a referee's whistle. Oh, yes, yeah. uh, 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 a whistle. That's got a high, if you've got a whistle, you've got a high pitched noise. Uh, that does almost as well. So, if you get approached by a big mammal, it might even work with buffalo. I haven't tried it on buffalo, but just blow a whistle and you've got a chance that it doesn't like the noise, it'll get away.
So it sounds as though an army, a, a Swiss army knife, a pair of boots, and a whistle, or a loud hailer with a high-pitched noise, yes, a, essential right, yes. pieces of kit for intrepid and, and a, explorers. And a corkscrew. And a corkscrew, not to <coughs> be forgotten, absolutely. Um, time for one last question. If anyone has one last question they'd like to ask. Well, no, well, in that case, um, I think, as I say, the book is, is available to uh, buy in the shop next door. And if you have any questions you want to ask John there, he'll be there signing. Um, but for the meantime, I would ask you to join me in thanking John Blashford-Snell. Thank you.